Good afternoon, everyone. Oh boy, that's a nice robust response. My name is Laura Washington. I'm a columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times and also a political analyst for ABC7 News. And I'm delighted and honored to be here to help facilitate this conversation today, especially here at Harold Washington College. Uh, I was just telling Ms. Hyman that my uh, mother uh, worked at Kennedy King College for about 15 years. And so I consider myself a City College's baby. And it's wonderful to see all the great faces out there, mostly students, um, because this event today is for you. This is about life and career. And so we're going to have, a, hopefully, a great conversation about both of those things, because they're inextricably intertwined. Uh, the, your life experiences are what, in, 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 in my opinion, make your careers. And so you're going to hear a lot about both. And, and we also have everyone, oh, I see everybody has their cards and pens. Uh, there should have been a card and a pen in your chair. And think about, as you hear the conversations, any burning questions that you want to hear uh, responses to. And then around uh, 20 or so to 5, or a little bit after that, we're going to collect those questions and we'll, and, and we'll bring them up here and give, give the chance for people to hear from you. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel. Cheryl Hyman is the chancellor of the City Colleges of Chicago, where she manages an educational system with a budget of nearly $500 million. 5,800 employees, and more than 120,000 students. Since her appointment in April 2010, she has worked to reinvent the city colleges into a 21st century world-class institution. Ms. Hyman is a graduate of Olive Howry College, and she holds an Executive Master of Business Administration degree from Northwestern University, a Master of Arts from North Park University, and a Bachelor of Science from the Illinois Institute of Technology. Cheryl Hyman. <laughs> Next to Ms. Hyman is Robert Clifford, who is a principal partner at Clifford Law Offices. Everyone knows that name. It's a personal injury law firm, and he also serves as the president of the Chicago Bar Association. He has represented clients in every major commercial airline crash in the United States, and, and, and including many high-profile plaintiffs. He shares his knowledge, is a frequent le lecturer for various bar associations, legal groups, and students throughout the country. Mr. Clifford holds the JD from DePaul University Call College of Law. Robert Clifford. Thank you. The Honorable Timothy C. Evans has served as the Chief Judge of the Circuit Court of Cook County for more than a decade. The Circuit Court of Cook County is one of the largest unified court systems in the world. More than 1.5 million cases go through that system every year. Mr. Evans previously served for 18 years in the Chicago City Council from Chicago's fourth ward, rising to become the council's floor re leader under Mayor Harold Washington. He's a graduate of the University of Illinois and received his JD from the John Marshall Law School in Chicago. As you can tell, we have a lot of Chicago people here. And I'd just like to ask each of you, starting with Ms. Hyman, to tell us how you came up, where you were born, and a little bit about how you grew up in Chicago. Also, if you could tell us one experience, one moment, one person, one issue that happened to you by the time you got to college, or even in college, that was something that was really significant in molding your life and your career. Yes. Ms. Hyman. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Harold Washington for hosting this, the president of Harold Washington, Don uh, Lackman, uh, who I'm very proud to say I recruited uh, to become president of uh, Harold Washington. Thank my panelists uh, for taking such an interest in city colleges and the students here and all the work that you helped me do and that you do for this city. Thank you. Um, I will talk very briefly uh, about uh, my growing up in Chicago, which is part of the very reason why I took this job, um, and uh, which is part of the very reason why I am so dedicated to uh, reinventing city colleges. I grew up on the west side of Chicago in CHA Housing Authority in Henry Horner. Now, right there, that was the first strike that some would have said I had against me growing up on the west side and in CHA. Um, I grew up there and as most of you have known, if you've read my bio, I talk very openly about the substance abuse problems that both my parents had and how at 16, um, I found myself most days doing my homework under a street light. 
um, on the west side of, of Chicago. Now, I'm happy to say that uh, both my parents survived that. As a matter of fact, uh, my mother lives with me now. Um, and, and so that's a blessing uh, and, and a testimony. But like many of you, I had many, many, many struggles and many, many, many hardships. But I knew, just like you all know, that your economic status should not and does not dictate your destiny in life. There's many issues that our students deal with that are beyond their control, that was inflicted upon them, which they had nothing to do with. So it is incumbent upon city colleges that this is a place where you can come and your dreams can be realized and your dreams can be fulfilled. Now, what was one of the pivotal moments uh, that made me know and realize beyond everything that I was dealing with that I could go on in life and achieve something? That was a teacher that I had at city colleges. His name was Keith Jordan. He is still today a math teacher at Olive Harvey College. And one of the first things I did when I became chancellor is had somebody take me to Olive Harvey so that I could thank him. I never forgot him. Um, I knew that I wanted to uh, study technology. I knew I had a niche uh, for technology, but I also knew that that uh, meant you needed to be very, very good in math and physics. <laughs> and that's a challenge. Uh, but I also knew, having uh, dealt with some of the struggles I had in life, that I wasn't quite sociably ready to just be thrust right into that four-year institution. And I, sure enough, was not financially ready. So City Colleges gave me that chance and put me on that track. And I have a lot uh, to be thankful for in my professors uh, at City Colleges who believed in me when every statistic would have said that I shouldn't be here as chancellor, uh, let alone still be uh, living today. So um, when people ask me, why did you leave uh, a career? I had a 14-year career at ComEd. I was one of the youngest executives uh, at ComEd, uh, doing very well financially in the private sector. And so when people, when people ask me, why would you give up that um, to come work in government? I, I can tell you right now, one of my main pieces of advice for students, if, if every choice you make in life is about economics and about money, you will make bad choices. You have to make a lot of choices with your heart, and you have to know that you were put on this earth not just for you, but for the benefit of other people. Corporate America couldn't have given me the opportunity to come back and make a difference in the lives of so many students who are struggling with some of the same issues I'm struggling with. So um, that's why I'm here. I'm proud to be here. First of all, what Keith Jordan did is gave me what I try to give many students, and that's hope. If every day we walk out these doors and we're faced with the challenges I was faced with, if every day we turn on the news and we see what uh, the Honorable Evans has to deal with, with the Honorable uh, Clifford is defending, we wonder just how much, what chances do we have? And so what we all need is hope, and Dr. Jordan did that. I mean, there was many of days I came to school, you know, sort of under the weather, uh, knowing what my uh, background was, very grateful for a grandmother who uh, took me in and all she wanted me to do was get a good education. You still are dealing with those challenges and everything in the world says that you can't make it. And he spent a lot of time showing me the, that I had the ability to make it, give, boosting my confidence. But more importantly, he taught me how to add, subtract, divide, <laughs> um, and, and a lot of that hard physics and math right. um, that I, I mean, he took that extra time. If there was times uh, where he saw I was struggling, when it was time for him to go home, he didn't. He stayed there and he helped and he coached me through it. Because of him, uh, he helped me both professionally and personally. Mr. Clifford, how'd you come up and what was that one thing that happened to you that made such a big difference in your life? You know, I, I don't know that I have one thing. Uh, like the Chancellor, uh, I had a lot of people in my life that helped me along. I grew up on the south side of Chicago right at the very end of the city uh, in an area called Mudville at the time because it was one of the last 
neighborhoods in Chicago to get uh, asphalt streets. And, and so I was born in 1951, if anybody, you know, for those of you who can relate to that that are here, not many of you, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, my dad was a carpenter and my mom was a housewife. She would say, she said, I don't know what that homemaker means. She said, I'm a housewife. And my mom, my good mother is still with us today. And uh, uh, but I, there was a neighborhood filled with uh, uh, police officers, firemen, uh, uh, blue collar workers, and 201, they would all counsel me to get an education. And, and they uh, just harped on that idea that if I wanted to get out of Mudville, I needed to get an education. And I went to DePaul, I applied to one college, and that was DePaul, I got accepted. I didn't like it my first year. Um, and DePaul's on the quarter system. Uh, after the first quarter, I went to the uh, Marine Recruiting Station uh, in <laughs> Roseland on uh, Michigan Avenue, and I almost signed up, and the guy said to me, he said, what are you, nuts, kid? Aren't you reading the paper? They're shooting your ass over there. <laughs> um, it's true. He said, go back to school one more quarter. If it doesn't work, then you come back and see me. And thank God he didn't say sign on the dotted line. I went to school. Something clicked in, I met someone, they, uh, they befriended me. I felt lonely uh, uh, the first years of college. I didn't know anyone. Um, I still had a job. I worked at a lumber yard. Uh, once again, the, that was uh, our family's pathway. My dad bought uh, materials at Courtesy Home Center at 95th and uh, South Park, 95th Martin Luther King Drive. And uh, they gave me a job and I went there after high school every day and I went there after school every day and the guys in the yard would say, what are you nuts kid, you want to work in this uh, forever, go get yourself an education. And uh, as it evolved, uh, uh, law school law clicked with me. I, I took a business law class in undergrad and I really uh, resonated with the concepts there. Um, I was not good at math or in uh, uh, physics. Uh, I was terrible in languages. I had to beg for a D to get out of French in high school. Uh, and, and true story, I mean, I went and begged to that brother, and I said, brother, you know, I went to Marist High School on the South Side, and then my good mother made sure that I got a, a good high school education. So, but I can remember uh, various individuals, whether it was that recruiter or a, a man in, in our neighborhood at that time, they were building new homes there, and, and I was befriended by the guy who was the uh, contractor who was building the homes and he would take me fishing on the lake at three o'clock in the morning and all those things and he was just an older guy. Um, I talked to him the other day, he's celebrating his 78th birthday, I've stayed in touch with him over the years and, and he was someone that just gave me the idea that life is a, a cup half full as opposed to half empty, that you always have to have hope, you always have to look to opportunity and it may sound corny, but the more you give, the more you grow. It's an awful lot easier to be nice and happy and friendly with people than it is to be mean-spirited to them. And when you have just learned to be a giving person, it comes back to you. And I've been a giving person my whole life. I, I have, uh, you know, I do injury work for a living. And you know, we, everybody's, oh, he's somebody that goes and goes running around and, and trying to get cases and all that. I am very proud of what I do. When, when the mud hits the fan, I'm one of the first people that, that uh, you know, people will go to for help because I'm there to help people. I do it the right way for the right reasons and I'm, and I'm proud of my, my profession. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a profession that, that protects people and it, and it just resonated to me. I'd be a terrible doctor, I'd, I'd be a terrible educator because those things just don't stick with me. But boy, you want to get into a street fight, I'll be right there with you. And we'll go. <laughs> <laughs> so, this you know. You're a Chicago guy through and through, I can I mean, tell. This is, From so, Mudville to Street Fight. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, but, but I've had a lot of, whether it's judges, when I was a young lawyer, you know, I walked in one of my first uh, uh, courtrooms and the judge there said, you know, Clifford, you know, you want to be a really good lawyer someday, you got to be prepared. Uh, pr preparation is the byword of all who pass through this courtroom and, and succeed. And, you know, so it's that education, it's the preparedness, it's a giving nature with your fellow students and fellow, you know, man. And when someone asks you for a little help and a little advice, you give it to them. Chief Judge Evans, how did you come up and what's that one? You could be like Mr. Clifford and give us 20 things. Well, <laughs> that um, made a difference. It's a pleasure to be here with, uh, with all of you. I, um, I was one of those who came here uh, from Arkansas. Uh, I grew up in the segregated South. I was one of those guys who uh, had to sit on the back of the bus and uh, enter the back doors of the, 
of the stores and uh, uh, the so-called new books that I received already had somebody else's name in them. And um, uh, at one point, perhaps you might remember uh, Central High School in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, Central High was one of the first um, nationally syndicated stories about the desegregation of the South. And there was a governor there by the name of Faubus who did not want to see the schools <coughs> desegregated in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so um, he decided that he would close the schools rather than desegregate the schools. And the students from Little Rock, Arkansas, came over to the small city where I lived. I, I lived in a small city called Hot Springs, Arkansas. It's a national park. It's where uh, President Clinton grew up. Um, when I uh, was in school there, uh, President Clinton's school was all white and my school was all black. But um, at one point, Faubus said that rather than integrate the schools, he had already closed the schools in Little Rock, he said he would close the schools in Hot Springs also. And that's where I lived and my mother decided that's enough. Arkansas is, is a state of opportunity and the first opportunity we got, we left. <laughs> uh, so we came here. Uh, I, um, I entered school um, at Hirsch High School. Hirsch is still on the south side. Mm -hmm. When I went there, they called it Almighty Hirsch. <laughs> and um, uh, the people who helped me were people who look just like you. They were black and they were white and they were Hispanic and they were Asian. Um, they were people interested in making certain that people from my generation made it. Mm -hmm. And um, Can you think, can you single out one? I know it's hard to single out one person, but there's, can you tell us a story about one person that had an impact? Well, um, the person who um, I um, was impacted by, I never met, uh, his name was Thurgood Marshall. Mm -hmm. And as I was um, going through uh, high school, he was opening doors for people who looked like me. And uh, I had read a book about him. Um, he had attempted to go to law school in Maryland. And because he was black, uh, he was not permitted to enroll in that school, and he went to school instead at Howard. But he said that um, he would either get in Maryland or get even with Maryland. <laughs> and one of the first cases he took once he became a lawyer was a case to desegregate the University of Maryland. And uh, he did do that. And he was an inspiration to me. Um, there were people who followed his lead, uh, people like um, Glenn T. Johnson, who became uh, a judge here. Uh, they made certain that I uh, had constructive things to do in the summertime. Uh, and it didn't seem to matter what it was, but to stay busy. Uh, I worked at uh, the Regal High School. I worked uh, on the highway uh, with an air hammer. Um, I, um, I worked for law, uh, a law um, firm as I was coming through. And um, I, um, I see people like you every day, both in front of me and like me. We have judges who are African American, Caucasian American, Hispanic American, Asian American, all groups. And um, we have 411 judges who look just like you. And one of the reasons I came is to let you know that anybody here, anybody here, can be a lawyer if that's what you decide to do. And that's what Thurgood Marshall's life means to me. What, he, I'm sorry, yes. what, what are the qualities that, that make for a good lawyer? Um, the ability to 
listen, to be committed to fairness and justice, to be uh, what I call um, the voice of reason. There are really three ingredients, and only three, that you need. And I think you would need these same three in whatever you decide to do. The voice of reason is the first. The second is have the courage to act on whatever is right. And the third is to be gracious to the high and the low. No matter what you encounter in life, if you do those three things, I assure you, you can be a lawyer or anything else you choose to do in this life. Great advice. Ms. Hyman, you, you were mentioned before that you came from the corporate world, and yes. here you are running this massive uh, city college system. Uh, you, you weren't professionally, <coughs> as far as I know from your resident, you weren't trained to become a chancellor. Not that there's right. a, I don't know There's how a chancellor get, school yeah. somewhere. So yeah. how, did you get, how did you get from ComEd here, and, and what, what lessons have you learned during that transition that have made you right. Right. a different and better person? Yeah. I don't, I, I'm still looking for that chancellor training. I, I don't know <laughs> if there's a degree you can go and get um, uh, in that. So I get asked this question a lot because um, uh, one of the first things I heard uh, when I came here is that, you know, you're not quote unquote an, an educator. Well, I had a couple answers to that. One, I never claimed to be one. What I claim to be is a leader with a proven track record of success who knows how to build the right team to get the job done. And so now I'm surrounded with a lot of good educators, which I know I need. The first key to success to leadership is know what you don't do well and then don't do that. <laughs> know, know, know what you need and get somebody to help you do that. Know what it is you do well and do it really good. And so it's no way anybody can run a college system and don't have good educators around them. And so I know I needed that and I, I do. I have, uh, we just uh, recruited uh, six new college presidents, every one of them PhD from the community college background. They're on the ground. Um, they're doing that uh, every day. So my first answer was that I don't claim to be one, but I do believe I have the right team to make it work. Uh, my second answer is everybody is an educator. You can teach him something, he can teach you something. We all can teach each other something. So depending on how we define educator, be careful to say who is and who's not an educator because you can learn from everybody. Some of the people uh, I learned the most from had no degree at all. And so uh, we, we need to be uh, careful about that. Now, however, now I'll answer the question now that I've said um, all that. Uh, I was recruited. Uh, out of the corporate sector by uh, the previous mayor, Mayor Daly, who wanted somebody who had a business background, but who also had the heart and the passion to understand each and every one of you, who had the heart and the passion to understand that this institution needed to be first and foremost about the student and what we needed to best do for the student. A different perspective an outsider with no biases, somebody who had lived and experienced this institution, but again, somebody that had a proven track record of leadership. And um, so I'll tell you the funny story that I often tell. It turned out to be funny. It could have turned out to be something different. I was out one day and I got a call um, from my assistant who said, uh, the mayor's office wanted to meet with you. Now, mind you, I was an executive, but I wasn't the CEO, so I wasn't typically the one that the mayor dealt with when he had issues. And so I thought it was a joke, or I thought it was somebody trying to get access to something else. So, you know, me and my big bad self said, well, get the person on the phone. <laughs> so she got the person on the phone, and I said, who are you, and you know, what, what do you want? Well, mayor, this is Mayor Daly's office, and he wants to meet with you. Well, I got very humble very quick. <laughs> and um, 
yeah. that meeting uh, got scheduled. And it was supposed to be a meeting that was due to last 30 minutes, which is a long time. Um, but it was a meeting that went on an hour and a half, mm -hmm. talking about the passion that he has for this city, the passion I have for students. And, and it was a, a scary moment. Did you, the, did you know going into that meeting that he was interested in you for the chance? Yeah, position? well, by that time, I'd heard some rumblings about <laughs> uh, that's what he could be interested in. But with all my track record of success, it was still a meeting I went to very nervous. And right. now you can approach these things in one or two ways. You can go to these meetings, you know, feeling proud, you know, that, yeah, I'm getting called by the mayor to take this job. Or you can go there saying, this puts the response, I will have the responsibility of 120,000 people in my hands. And you cannot mess that up. And, and so uh, I was nervous about it. Uh, wasn't nervous whether I would have the, uh, the capability to do it, but it's, it's huge. Mm -hmm. It's a huge calling. And so at the end of the day, and after much prayer and thinking about it, I did realize that I needed to leave a career to take on a calling. How did you prepare for that meeting? Uh, and, you know, it's, it's Mr. Clifford said, preparation is key. What did you do to prepare for that meeting? Yeah, pr preparation is key. Well, the first thing I did is that I was a student here. Um, and, and so sitting back and reflecting on what the institution had did for me, but also just sitting back reflecting on my desire to want to make a difference in the world. So out of all the things that I've been through in life, my biggest wish in life was to be able to do for others what people had given me the opportunity to do. So I could have enjoyed all the success I've had, but without being able to have that impact on other people, and, and it's kind of, it was hard for me being an executive doing so well, then I'd go home and listen to the news or I'd hear about people I went to school with who didn't make it. And, and so uh, that bothered me. And, and so this was sort of that, that dream. And, and, and I guess to answer the question uh, more clearly, the other piece of advice that I give students all the time, and this may sound like something you hear all the time, but I am a true testimony that it's true. Follow your heart. When you follow your heart, the only preparation you need is the education and the hard work that goes behind it. You don't have to manufacture anything. You don't have to make up anything. You don't have to be somebody who you're not. And so the best preparation I had going into this is the desire to want to change all of you all's lives. Bob Clifford, uh, you're a litigator. What is that, and what, and how did you, how, how did you choose that field? You're in the personal injury uh -huh. field. You're, well, you, there are uh, many, many different kinds of law, many different uh, types of lawyers. Uh, people ask me what I do for a living. I just say, oh, I sue people for a living. So, um, <laughs> and I, I did not. I did not seek out uh, to do personal injury work. I was in a law school class, you talk about people who make a difference in your life. I met my, the man who became my boss, and through a, a long story, he gave me a job, and, but one of the things that he taught me, and I'm hearing some commonality in the remarks by Judge Evans and, and Chancellor Hyman, one of the things that he taught me was that when I learned as a lawyer that what I was doing was not about me, that it was about the people I'm serving, that is a freedom, that's a release that allows you to be, instead of being selfish, you're selfless. That instead of treating people as if they owe you something, you're taking care of them in a way that you would want to be done if, you, uh, if, if it was your case that is being handled. And I think when you know, the judge talks about being gracious to all who are high and low, when the chancellor talks about caring about the students, uh, you know, it's the same thing being a good lawyer, a litigator. I, what I litigate to accomplish a goal on an efficient, effective basis for people. 
who, you know, I, I don't make excuses for representing a family of, uh, you know, where, where someone died leaving a wife and children and a drunk driver crosses the center line or a manufacturer, uh, uh, you know, develops a product that they openly put into the marketplace knowing they're going to make a few bucks and some people are going to nevertheless get hurt and they don't care about it. Or the man whose case I'm about to start, there was an explosion and there was a company that consciously made a decision not to do something that would have saved him from being the most horribly burned man in America to have lived and still live. Uh, these are people who need help, and, it's, and if I can't give them that help, then I don't deserve to be there for them. So, you know, I agree with the judge. Anyone in this room, if they wanted to be, could be a lawyer. Are there obstacles today? No question about it. The cost of legal education today has gone through the roof. Uh, there's a fair criticism going around that the law schools are just there to uh, charge tuition and churn the dollars and make some dough. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if you care about people, trying to seek uh, uh, out a life in the law is a, a, you know, a very courageous, humbling thing. Judge Evans could be a, a, you know, a lawyer, major partner in any one of the big law firms in this town, he's, yet he's chosen a life of public service. He was one of our most celebrated uh, uh, aldermen at the time and, and uh, stood as the floor leader for Mayor Harold Washington. At, this is named, I don't know if that's come out yet tonight, this is Harold Washington's lawyer. Uh, okay, so this, you know, he could be doing an awful lot of other things, but he has a giving, gracious way about him. And, and so you want to be a litigator, you know, that's why I tell young lawyers all the time, this is, being a lawyer doesn't mean that everything's nuclear war. Uh, being a lawyer means that you want to be effective, you want to be, look at the paper in the morning, if you were reading about what you did yesterday, you wouldn't be reading bad things. Mm -hmm. That's important. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if I answered that's, your question. That's, that's a fabulous answer. There's a lot of passion there, and passion, you really have to love, and you, you lead, said you really have to love what you do. Lead follower, get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Evans, yes. as he pointed out, you are, you are a former politician, recovered <laughs> politician, uh, <laughs> long time, I want to hear long this time answer. successful politician, elected <laughs> official. What lessons did you glean from that p period of your life that, that are valuable to you now as a judge? Well, uh, it is true. Um, um, one of my role models was uh, the man after whom this school is named, uh, Harold Washington. And um, um, I consider public service to be a high and noble calling, as he did. Uh, I can recall once um, when uh, we were on uh, a tour to name uh, a city as a sister city for the city of Chicago. And we went to uh, Beijing, China. This was in <coughs> the middle 80s. And um, we saw uh, Chairman Mao in his waxed uh, mausoleum. And Harold Washington uh, turned to me and to others and said, um, you know, I've worked in public service all of my life and I wonder how I will be remembered. This is the way they chose to remember their leader. Uh, and he could not um, perceive of a, um, a wax uh, likeness of himself. That wasn't the way he wanted to be remembered. And I think uh, right now, this afternoon, he's looking down and he's very proud of the fact that the way he is remembered is an educational institution giving people an opportunity to learn. And it's really education that uh, is the key. I hope you know that. No matter whatever else we say, the education you get is the one that will catapult you forward. And uh, uh, here in Chicago, yeah, he's remembered as the first African-American mayor. I like to think he was the first uh, great mayor, <laughs> not just black mayor, but great mayor. Uh, I, I've, um, as, as Washington indicates, uh, I've been a part of the uh, political atmosphere for a long time. I was in the city council for 18 years before uh, becoming a judge, and I've been a judge now. This is my 20th year. Um, Harold Washington helped to mold my career, helped to mold uh, Laura Washington's career as well. I can remember seeing her 
um, getting some of his speeches together and trying to make certain that he would follow those because... <laughs> oh, that was a tough one. <laughs> I worked in the mayor's press office and, and helped write his speeches and prepare them, yeah. No he, question. He never st stuck to the script. No, he, he didn't. <laughs> but, you know, he was just anxious to reach whoever he was talking to because it was so important to him. Um, I don't think Harold ever expected to live a long time. He, he used to say, I'm going to be mayor for 20 years. And uh, I was wet behind the ears. I believed it, you know. Uh, but he loved this city. He loved what you're doing. He loved the fact that you could find a way to open a door that might otherwise be shut to you and to somebody else who's supposed to follow you. And the one thing that uh, I'd, I'd uh, uh, like to emphasize here is that he believed in the mentor-mentee system where when you learn something, you share it with somebody else. When you get something, you share it with somebody else. And his position is mine, that what you learn is not just for you. It's for you and many people you have never met. Uh, there's somebody in here right now. I have no doubt about it. And we're talking to you, and you think we're talking to the person sitting next to you but we really are talking to you. And if you're supposed to be a lawyer, you will be a lawyer, whether you know it now or not. And there's somebody somewhere waiting for you to get that degree who is about to lose their housing, who has signed a contract that they didn't read, who's driving a car that is not performing the way it's supposed to perform, and it's your job to get them justice. And so um, I, that's what I learned about public service. It's, as, as my colleagues have said up here, it's not just for us. It's for all of us. And you will do it, that's for sure. And I am talking to you. Thank you. And I'm getting a lot of great questions up here, and a lot of them are real nuts and bolts questions. This audience wants to know, how do you get there? So one question for both. Mr. Clifford and Mr. Evans is, are there specific majors or classes that you would recommend a prospective law student take? Before you go to law school, what, kind, what classes or majors should you That's consider? an excellent question. I don't know who asked that question, but it's a very good one. And it gives me a chance to say this. Everything that you need to learn about being a lawyer, you learn in law school. So you don't have to have a pre-law curriculum. If you are an English major and you can speak well and write well, you're an excellent candidate to become a lawyer. If you uh, are in science, for example, um, when I first uh, signed up in college, I was going to go to medical school and, and the medical school people were required to get a degree in zoology. Well, I changed my major because of Thurgood Marshall that I told you about, but I still got the degree in zoology so that when things like DNA came along, that was in my field. I knew all about the science. And so your science background is great. Uh, whatever it is, I, I spoke to a judge the other day, and I was just chatting with her. You know what her, her background was? She was in physical education, got that degree, and went on to law school. So no one here has an excuse. Whatever you are studying, that will get you to law school and get you that degree if that's what you want to do. And the only thing I can add to that is that <laughs> whatever it is that uh, really lights you up, and, and you know it, okay? I, 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 again, I wasn't lit up by the sciences, I wasn't lit up by math, but I, I loved history, I loved the spoken word, I enjoyed psychology because I enjoyed people, and the thing that I count my lucky stars about today is that every morning I get up, I swear to you, I love what I do for a living and I believe I've been blessed to have that in my life. So whatever it is that inspires you, you know, that's why at school you have such a great curriculum from which to choose. Whatever just, you know, rocks your boat. That's what you want to be doing because if you do well at that, the uh, uh, administrators who are do reviewing all the college, all the law school applications, 
They're, yeah, they're going to look at your LSAT and all that stuff, but they're going to see how you did and performed in undergraduate school. And they're going to want to see if the things that you tell them in your written submission are uh, resonating with you and they resonate <coughs> with your performance, then they're going to take that into account in evaluating your qualifications to get into law school. And so I'll I mean, just add, if you ever become chancellor, make sure you hire some really good attorneys. Like <laughs> <laughs> and that is really, and that's important why. That is, that is important because when you are the head of any CEO of any institution, a lot, you, you sign a lot of things. My name probably appears on more things across the city than um, any of you can even imagine. You sign a lot of things, uh, you say a lot of things, and everything you say is censored, but you also deal with a lot of things that is your responsibility that you have no control over or know anything about. Anybody can slip and fall in a school. Something else, some other incident can happen at a school. It, it's me uh, uh, who have to defend that. So. Um, th there's quite a few really good lawyers uh, <laughs> that you should surround yourself with at all times. All right, we have another uh, technical legal question about the role of paralegals, an important role in the legal, profi legal profi profession. What is the role <coughs> of paralegals, and should paralegals be licensed or certified to provide services directly to the public? Uh, I don't know about the directly to the public part because I think that's practicing law without a license and people can get in an awful lot of trouble if they're not getting advice from the right person. So there has to be some measure, of, you know, control over that, some regulation of that. But I could tell you that the modern day law firm could not exist without paralegals. There's an incredible role for them and I think a growing role for them because one of the things that they do is they can help process cases in an effective, efficient way. What do, what do, they, what do they do exactly? They organize files, they, they, they make sure that the train stays on the track and on time and in an effective way, in an efficient way uh, because there, there's an awful lot nowadays with the visual uh, a presentation of a case or a representation. Lawyers don't don't have the time necessarily to go out and study what's uh, all the advances in technology right now. Where paralegals, in fact, are looking at how social media is impacting their ability to help the lawyers do their job and to help their clients. Paralegals are studying that DNA and forensic uh, evidence to know which is the best way to organize a presentation of that kind of material for a representation. Paralegals are essential to the practice of law, and I think it's some, an area that's going to grow. Mm -hmm. Is there a special train, training there, for that? Oh, yeah, there is. In fact, I know it's <coughs> done at Wright, and I know there's consideration being given to uh, maybe having uh, programs here downtown, but mm -hmm. definitely uh, it, it's an area that across the country, I mean, I travel an awful lot um, with, you know, in, in my work both with the Bar Association but also in my practice, and you see that every law, you'll see law firms that have more paralegals than they have lawyers. It is a accredited program just for a paralegal. Um, training. We offer it now at Wright, and as Mr. Clifford said, we, uh, under our college to careers model, we uh, are looking at Harold Washington having a strong focus on business and professional services. And so uh, you can stay tuned because very soon you will probably see that same uh, program here. Judge Evans? Yeah, I would add that it often is the first entree to getting that law degree. And it's, uh, you might think of it as uh, a kind of law clerk. And uh, I mentioned to you, uh, I was lucky enough to get a job like that while I was in law school. And uh, I think that it's one of the things that enabled me to know that I really could do this. Uh, I, I can recall just down the street, um, my, uh, my uh, law school, was at Plymouth Court, and uh, I had just gotten a job. Uh, they called it paralegal, but it was really just a job as a, as a law clerk. And they gave me my assignment, and I went over to the Daily Center. And um, I walked into this room. There were about 100 people in there appearing before the judge. And it only hit me at that particular point that 
I probably was going to get embarrassed because I was just starting law school. I didn't know exactly what I was doing. I was going to just follow the orders given to me by the, the law firm. And so I had an idea. I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll sit in the back and I'll, I'll watch what uh, the lawyers do when they uh, walk up to their case and then I'll just, uh, I'll just imitate them. I, I will, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll speak up and, and so forth. And, um, you know, of course, what happened. Uh, they called my case first. <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, they, I'm new. They don't know that I'm here for that case. Uh, I, could, I could ease right out. I could go out to the bathroom. And, and uh, then I looked up there, and there was a deputy up there with a gun on his hip. I said, well, no, maybe I'd better go on up and, <laughs> and uh, speak up. And I did that. I, I walked up, and the, the judge looked down at me, and he was so kind. He was so considerate. He, he didn't treat me like uh, some of those television shows you see, you know, where uh, it was the Judge Judy and some of those. No, 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 it was none of that. Uh, he wasn't interested in calling me a name or calling me a liar or uh, up, upbraiding me or anything. In fact, he addressed me just like I was already a lawyer. And he asked me a question. I thought, oh, oh here, here it comes. And as it turned out, I listened to him and I could answer the question. And he asked me another question and I answered that one. And it was at that point in my life I knew I could do this. Um. And in your life there will come a time when you realize whatever hesitation you have had, you will put that hesitation aside. You'll know why you're here, and you will do what you're supposed to do. That happened to me. I'd be willing to bet you it happened to each one of my colleagues up here at one point or another, sometimes and it will happen to you. Sometimes you have to be thrown to the sharks to learn how to swim. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> and you learn how to swim really fast. Yeah. <laughs> yes. This question is for all three of you, and it's about networking. Has networking been important to your success? And if so, how did you go about it? And what advice would you offer people, uh, recent graduates and students, about networking? I couldn't live without networking. It's how, uh, it's how I get new business. It's how I make friends. It's uh, how I live my life. And, and uh, networking is just a fancy word for trying to get to know a whole lot of people. <laughs> and it, there's also, but, but I, I'm a firm believer, you heard me say it, the more you give, the more you grow. You know, I try to be a helpful, giving person. You, you can't help everyone. You can't do everything everyone needs um, and, and the like. But, you know, you can have a, a good spirit that's a giving spirit. And when people know that, they resonate with that, and you make a friend. And, uh, boy, it's just worked for me my whole life. I, I'd rather have someone my friend than my enemy. I mean, I, I, just important. Networking, again, just friend making, okay? For the right reasons, too, because you want to learn about new people and be engaged in what they're doing. And let's, you know, you got to be a good listener. And, and you can't have everything. You know, there, some lawyers are really snobby, geeky people. Like, I've got this one lawyer I'm dealing with right now that every other word is I, I did this, <laughs> I did that. You know, that person did that because that's I told him to do that. I mean, I'm sick of that, you know? <laughs> you can't have that. It's not about I. It's not about you. It's about us. And it's about, you know, being engaged with people in a positive way. So how do you go about the network? What's your, do you have a strategy? Yeah, 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 my, make sure you hit every cocktail party uh, every yeah, night? You know, or, <laughs> and, uh, my strategy is to participate in things like this, to be involved in the Bar Association, uh, to, to uh, try to identify a, a need that's out there. I mean, I, I've got a, a luxury of being able to do a lot of things. Like right now, I'm about to pick on those people that send you an email and they say, if you want to unsubscribe. Well, wait a minute. I didn't subscribe to anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to unsubscribe. So I'm, I've got lawyers right now research, researching that to see if we can pick a big fight with somebody to stop unsubscribe. That's giving. That's <laughs> That'll make me a lot of friends. <laughs> sure will. I love hanging out with Mr. Clifford. Um, networking, this is a topic that you hear everywhere, right? I mean, getting to know people, expanding your Rolodex, you know, uh, that's all important. Of course it is. You need to get to know people. You need uh, uh, to network with people who could say, 
uh, you shouldn't do that. The key to networking for me is how you go about networking. So networking to me does not mean I have to be seen at every party. As a matter of fact, I probably fight the opposite and my team really has to make me go outside the office. It doesn't mean you have to spend your time uh, uh, chasing behind who you think should see you or get to know you. Because trust me, if you're working hard, somebody somewhere is watching. I'd never talked to Mayor Daly before in my life, but I got that phone call mm -hmm. because of something that I was doing. So it's how you go about networking. And some of the best opportunities has come for me by doing things I would, that I was not paid to do. When I was at uh, ComEd, there was an organization called the Exelon, because ComEd is a subsidiary of Exelon, the bigger utility company. There was a organization called the Exelon African American Members Association. And ComEd and Exelon was very good about embracing diversity, real diversity. So there was a group for every, uh, for, for every ethnic group uh, represented in the company. And I got involved with that group. It was not something you got paid to do. You had to spend a lot of time because the groups really were about trying to make a difference in, in the community and in the company uh, uh, for people. And I worked that job and, and being in that group as if I was getting paid. Uh, I eventually became vice president of that particular group, but it was the work I did there. Now, mind you, my paid job was nuclear engineering and IT. That sounds like really big, right? But that wasn't what people were watching. They were watching this volunteer work that I was doing and going through the community, and I wasn't getting paid for that. But it was something I was personally passionate about, and it allowed me that networking opportunity. And so networking is a subject that you know you hear all the time. People talk about, of course, it's good to get to know people. Of course, you should talk to people. The, the other thing, and one of my mentors at ComEd, John Hooker, who Laura uh, knows well, and Frank Clark uh, taught me this, everybody is important. You treat the doorman the same way as you treat the man in the boardroom, the exact same way. So it's how you network, it's how you uh, treat people, and it's how you go about it, which is uh, extremely important to me. Judge Evans? Uh, I would add, uh, depending upon what it is that you're hoping to accomplish, uh, I know, you know now you have Twitter and all of that, but uh, one of the easiest ways to get started is to do what you can on your block. Um, for example, um, if there is a church on your block, it may not be your congregation, it may not even be your particular uh, religious bent, but I'd be willing to bet you that that church needs something. And uh, if I were you, I'd start there. Um, for people going into politics, and I, you know, in Chicago, where the president's from, you might be interested in politics someday. Mm -hmm. uh, build it block by block. Um, and uh, that's a, an excellent way to network because um, uh, uh, problems that you will encounter on each block will give you something to do. And you'll have some people interrelating with you as you build on that. If you're going to run uh, for um, alderman, for example, uh, block by block is the way to do it. Uh, one minister knows another minister. If you, if you volunteer in one minister's church, I assure you another minister will find out what it is that you're doing. And uh, build it that way. There's no easy way to do it. You have to want to do it. And uh, the chancellor is exactly right, uh, uh, Attorney Clifford exactly right. What you do for somebody else is what your networking is based on. It's not what somebody can do for you that gets your name around. It's what you have done for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, as an example, if, if you got time sure, for an go example, ahead, go ahead. let's say on, on your block you see people uh, walking their animals, uh, you know, dog, cat, whatever it is. Um, you do that 
I assure you, everybody on the block will know who you are. Uh, if you are willing to, let's say, uh, take care of children, uh, maybe children who get out of school before their parents get home, you're willing <laughs> to have them over at your house, and you're reading to them, or you help them with the math, or you, you assist them in some way, I assure you, people will know who you are. So as long as what you do is for somebody else, that's the key to networking, in my opinion. Final question, and this is uh, something that relates to networking, and that is, it's pretty intimidating. I mean, you, all three of you are spectacularly successful people. You work very hard to get to where you, you're, you, are, you are, but you've got the world in your hands. Maybe some, some of the folks in the audience are probably pretty intimidated by you. So even to network with you might be difficult, much less to, to strangers who they've never met. What, what advice do, do each of you have to get over that intimidation of being fearful of power, of powerful people? And, and how do you make connections? How do, they, how do they make connections with busy, powerful people like you? And, and, is, and is, that, is that even an important thing to do? You know, I, I, I'll give you my, my thought on it. Um, I don't think you should hesitate to let people know what is on your mind. Uh, if you are, are interested in teaching, for example, or if you're interested in, in uh, some walk of life that would be in the chancellor's bailiwick, she would not uh, <coughs> refuse to talk to you. Why, I mean, why would you think anybody would do that? Uh, Bob Clifford, uh, I've seen him go to places where he is the last person to leave because he's talking to everybody. But he's also the same guy, you turn on public television and you see this program <coughs> is brought to you by the Clifford Law Firm. That's how he's able to do that. Uh, so uh, know who you are. Believe in yourself, no matter what. And by the way, in this life, you're not going to win every time. Several of the people that have been mentioned here, I lost to. Uh, the one who gave uh, the chancellor her <laughs> great day. I ran against him. Uh, he got 500,000 votes, I got 417,000. He beat me. But the point is, we became the best of friends. And uh, when it came time for me to be considered as chief judge, he was right there saying, yeah, yeah, Tim can do it. So, no, no, in this life you're going to win some and lose some. You're going to fall down. You're going to have to get up. That's okay, because that's what life is all about. I think you've got to remember something the judge said earlier today, and that is that uh, in his mind uh, you will be a success if you are as gracious to the high uh, uh, in society and life as the low. And he lives that, I know. And I must tell you, though, I think that's something that's very common to successful people. Successful people are successful not because they have the most money in the bank or anything like that. Successful people are out to achieve worthy goals. And at least in my book, and if I reflect upon the, some of the most important successful people I've known, They've been generous with their, their thoughts and their time because they're not judgmental. You know, don't be judgmental about people. And most, so when you come up to folks like us or even just among yourselves, don't be judgmental about them. And remember the words that, that, that the judge said about that being gracious because that is, I mean, here, he, he ran against Richard Daly. I knew, I knew no Richard Daly one of the kindest men that you'd want to meet. Uh, the, the same is true, you know, we all, uh, in this camp, we all know President Obama, we all know President Clinton, we've met them all. Gracious people that are always kind to the high and the low. I mean, it just resonates. Frank Clark, I know Frank Clark, what a nice man. I don't know him from Adam, but I know that he's someone that would be approachable. You know, so let's remember that. He's from Hirsch, by the way, where I went to he school. He is. There you go. I yeah. thought about that when yeah. you said it. Yeah, we were classmates. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, one of, it, it's a couple things. First of all, 
you need to understand that no, no matter how powerful somebody gets or perceives themselves to be or think they are, you think they are, they're still human. They still go home and have the same worries that you do, and even more so. They still have some of the same challenges in their life. They still have to wake up and eat breakfast and get lunch and dinner and do it. it. They're human. So always remember that, that people are always human. The other thing to remember is any good leader knows that the only way they remain a leader is being willing to take ideas from anybody who's willing, willing to give them to you. Mm -hmm. It is a many a day that I'll surprise a student that a stu student will, I get emails by the ton a day, and almost every single one of them I read. Now, do I respond to all of them? I can't. But you can believe that my team dreads those emails <laughs> because I am always looking for action. And if there's good ideas, students will tell you, I will have somebody follow up, I will listen to them, I serve you all. So any good leader is always looking for good ideas, but good leaders are always looking at people. There are students, there are employees in city colleges who I've watched and been watching and they don't even know it. But I've tapped them one day to say, look, I think you should work on this project, I think you should work on that project. And, and so just remember that they're always human. They're always people, they're always looking for, for good ideas. They're always looking at, at who's doing good work. So I know it may seem like sometimes we have the world in our hands, but a lot of times we have the world on our shoulders. And that gets really heavy. And uh, so I'm always looking for good ideas and, and talking to students. And, and so I just would tell you, uh, lastly, Always remember, I came from where you at, where you're at now. Absolutely, and struggle is also part of success. Str the biggest and the the biggest uh, ingredient to success is failure. If you don't know how to fail, or if you are afraid to fail, you will never be successful because you will never take the risk that it takes to get where you are. And my philosophy for success is very simple. Get a quality education and work hard. And if that doesn't work, get some more education and work harder. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice to end this program on Cheryl Hyman, Bob Clifford, Tim Evans. Thank thanks so much for all you do. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Always good being with you, Sean. Thank you.